Good, Ahmed. Very good. Very nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Thank you for your participation. My pleasure. Thank you. It is an honor for us. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure to be with, with, with all of you. Thank you very much. All of you are well welcome. Thank you very much. Shall we start, Prof? Professor Ahmed, we have just one minute to start. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. How are you, Dr. Abdul Salam? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Professor Alam, you, you tried the link? Yes, yes, he did it with me. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Ahmed al Sheikh, welcome everyone. Welcome. Okay, Dr. Ahmed Alam, may, may we start, sir? Yes, one moment, please. Just let me know when you are ready. Yes, I am attaching the file. I am making share. Okay. You have my presentation now? Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's a great honor and great pleasure for me to announce the start of the second day of LRS uh, Banha online course. Uh, this night, we have a collection of eminent stars from Egypt and from UK. Uh, we will start the, uh, the night, the scientific night, with a talk of Professor <laughs> Ahmad Alam, the head of the deformity planning in Banha Faculty of Medicine. May you start, sir? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. We will talk about radiological assessment of lower limb deformity. It is good to say that for proper analysis of the lower limb deformity, the X-rays should be taken at the proper way. For proper orientation of these X-rays, they should be taken with the limb at the proper alignment. So now we have two definitions, orientation and alignment. What is limb alignment? What is limb orientation? At what is the difference? Orientation is a noun. That means the act of proper perception of a data or knowledge. Like this X-ray, this is a knowledge. This is, is an orientation. Alignment is another noun. That means that arrangement of the items in a line. Like this patient is standing in this way. This is an alignment. So we have the standing posture of the patient or his alignment and the X-ray, which is the orientation. However, because the patient can stand in different ways, like these photos, we can have different orientations and this will make interpretation of X-ray different. And this is not should be the case. So X-rays are nothing but just a type of shadow. My alignment is the truth. X-ray is its reflected shadow Perception of this is the orientation. This is a shadow for this orientation. This is orientation making this, this is sorry, this is alignment making this shadow or orientation. This is another monster. This is distorted image or this shadow is for a nice puppy. That is because the light source having a different angle not giving the truth. And so can the X-ray. It can distort an image and give false impression. So to have a proper orientation, we should have a proper one fixed alignment, no different alignments. The patient to the right, having internal tibial torsion with genuvalgum, while the most left one looks if we have an X-ray for him as more or less normal. How can this affect our work? This video will illustrate this. This young lady has severe deformity in the form of right genovarum, left genovalgum. This is very evident deformity. 
Sorry, but because I'm working from the, my mobile, there's a problem in working it. Oh, sorry. Is the video? Yes, you are here. This patient, when standing, she have 70 degree valgus and 90 degree, 70 degree verum and 90 degree valgus. This is impossible. No one can stand or walk in this position. When we have for this alignment and X-ray orientation, while she's standing by this way and making some drawings, we have right femoral problem, more or less good right tibia, left femoral problem, more or less good left tibia, according to these X-rays and this orientation, which is faulty. These drawings give us idea that we should do bilateral supracondylar femoral osteotomy. However, the patient was treated with tibial on the right and femoral on the left side. Sorry, again, the problem of the videos. Well, that's what I want you to see. He, he, she is working well, but the video, video is not working. However, I want to say that where is the mistake? This is the first slide again for proper analysis of the lower limb deformity. We should have X-ray in a proper way by having proper alignment for giving us proper orientation. In another words, simply the limb should be positioned in relation to X-ray in a proper way. These animals are not in my backyard, of course. So we should have standards for our X-rays. First standard is to have planes to be taken. Radiographs of the lower limb should be obtained at least in two planes, frontal or AP and sagittal or lateral view. Why at least two planes? Simple example, this patient with femoral and tibial deficiency, when we look for her from the AP view, if we haven't the lateral view, we will miss a lot of problems. Second, how to position? Standing radiographs are the standard. If we can, the patient should be standing. But the problem is for standing, most radiograph technologists are accustomed to stand the patient at position of attention, like a soldier with the feet looking forward, irrespective to their deformity. If we position our patient or align her in such manner, we have a grave deformity that is not correct. So she should lie down. In this case, we shouldn't have the erect or standing X-ray. Of course, the deformity is much lessened clinically and radiologically, of course. That is because these patients have a lot of ligamentous laxity, flexion deformity or flexion attitude that makes them compensate for this by this posture. And should this should be measured or eliminated for proper calculations. Let us start with the knee. For proper, true, anthroposterior view of the knee, this should be obtained as follows. If the patient lies like this, this is an AB. This is another AP. This is the true one with genovalgum and internal tibial torsion. How to differentiate? To avoid having a mistaken X-ray like this. The true AB of the knee should be obtained with the knee looking forward. The point or reference point is the patella, which should be centered over the femoral condyles. If the patient has external or internal tibial torsion, such, such a position, the result of the handicap, the, the kneecap is pointing inward or outward. The correct method to have this true AP is to orient the patella forward, irrespective to the position of the foot. 
whatever it is going inward or outward, I should have the patella looking forward. So this is faulty alignment. This is still faulty alignment. We have marks here for the patella. The right one is the right alignment with the patella looking forward, irrespective to the position of the feet. How to do this? By two fingers, you feel the patella, move it from side to side, and center it over the femoral condyles and make it perpendicular to the coming beam of the X-ray, irrespective to the position of the foot. This is appearance, and this is the X-ray that should be. The X-ray on the left, the most left one is the feet looking forward. This is incorrect. The one to the right is the correct position with the patella looking forward, irrespective to the position of the foot. And this is a mistake that occurred for this young lady. The two patellae were not looking forward, giving false images. It is clear from these views for the patel, for the tibia, the right tibia, this looks like a syndesmotic view, the left tibia, tibia is not an AB, that is nearly a full overlap of the tibia and fibula. This is not an AB because of the limb rotation. For this method of centering the patella anteriorly, we have only one pitfall that some patients with fixed subluxation or dislocation of the patella cannot be positioned in this position. Or sometimes we have a patient with excised patella for some reason. For these patients, like this one with fixed subluxation, the prominent part here is not the patella, it's the medial femoral condyle. When the patient lies down, the matter, the alignment, the orientation are totally different. The patella when looks forward, the total limb alignment is different. And such patient couldn't be x-rayed both sides at the same time. You should have each limb separately to can make it at the proper alignment to have a proper orientation. Cases with fixed subluxation of patella or absent patella for excision due to any reason. This could be replaced by doing another method, which is a plane of knee flexion extension axis. We simply make the patient make flexion extension and rotating the foot medially and laterally till we have this axis or this plane perpendicular the coming beam of X-ray. And this is a plane of knee flexion extension which is corresponding to the proper plane that we should take for the AP of the knee. Moving it internally and externally to have it perpendicular to beams. To complete, after having the reference of patella anteriorly, we said before the patient should be standing. It is better, except in some cases, we should have long film cassette and the radiographic tube or the X-ray source should be positioned at 10 feet, which is approximately three meters away. The film should be long enough to include hips, knees, and ankles. Or if we haven't long films, we should have overlapping films with marks. If we photograph the patient in this way, we have a magnification of 5%. And a very important point is the X-ray beam position. The X-ray beam should be centered on the knee joint. This is a very important point because as we see in this diagram, we have central rays or central beam of X-ray, which is the straight line. And we have the scattered rays, which are the dotted lines. When we are interested with the knee, the central beam or the center of the tube of X-ray should be centered over the knee to have a proper angle for X-raying the knee. Of course, we can need to do something like this in the operating room to measure some angles intraoperatively. We can do the same, but with little differences that we in the operating rooms have shorter films, which are separate films and also the height of the ceiling will not allow to have three meters height 
So we will have lesser height with more or bigger magnification. Like these figures, here we have one film coming from the hip to the knee, another film coming from the knee to the ankle. And in both cases, we don't move the X-ray tube. It should be always centered over the knee, not moving with the cassette. The cassette is a moving part. The X-ray tube is the fixed part in this machine. Don't forget that patients with limb lens discrepancy have some compensatory mechanism that can affect this alignment. These patients have contralateral knee flexion, ipsilateral ankle equinus, pelvic tilt, and sometimes scoliosis. They try to compensate for limb lens difference by this way. This should be eliminated as it can alter the alignment and subsequently the orientation. Simply, we can do lifting of the short limb with wooden blocks according to the missed height. Another point is some patients have ligamentous laxity or knee laxity, either varus or valgus. This should be assessed while the patient is supine, either with the stress method by manual or the block method for the genoverum or the strap method for the genovalgum. Also, if we have knee flexion contracture, if we have an AP anteroposterior, there will be overlap between the femur and tibia and the joint line will not be clear. This patient should be photographed with the patient facing the long film or having it posterior anterior instead of anterior posterior to have clear view to the plateau and the joint line. This is an old photo about 14 years ago in a SAMI meeting Japan. This is part of our Egyptian team at that time. My dear friend, Muhammad Al-Ashab, is behind me here. We were talking about the anteroposterior view, the proper one for the knee. Now we will talk about the anteroposterior for the ankle and for the hip. The same frontal plane orientation for the ankle and the hip could be measured with the same knee forward anteroposterior radiograph if we have no torsional or rotational deformities, either tibial or femoral, if there is only angular, no rotational deformity, the same film for the knee could be used for ankle and hip. But if there is a torsional deformity, we should have a separate ankle forward and a separate hip forward radiographs. Again, this is a clear example for this. First, the ankle forward radiograph. As we have for the knee, the reference was the patella. Here for the ankle, the reference of the foot, if it has no deformities. So the foot here should be pointing forward to have a proper ankle anteroposterior view. Irrespective to the position of the patella, I shouldn't consider patella here in my calculations. I should respect ankle with foot without looking to the patella. The most important point again is that the beam should be centered on the ankle. So the X-ray tube should be lowered down to the level of the ankle. For the hip forward radiograph, we make maximum internal rotation, maximum external rotation and measure it and to putting the hip in midway rotation between these and having the beam centered over the hip. So we should elevate again the tube for the X-ray up. So this is for the hip. We don't respect the position of the patella nor the position of the foot. We just have halfway rotation between external and internal hip rotation and to position the hip to have its proper anterior view. This could be repeated also in the operating theater. If we have no torsional deformity, we can use the anteroposterior for the knee. If we have torsional deformities, we should have as downwards on the right, forward projection for the hip. The X-ray tube is centered over the hip and for forward projection for the ankle, the one down and to the left photo, 
the X-ray tube is centered over the ankle. This is very important to avoid having the oblique or scattered rays giving us improper orientation. This was at UK at Sheffield several years ago, nine years. We finished now the anteroposterior radiograph for the ankle, knee, and hip. For the lateral radiographs, for the knee, it is 90 degree perpendicular for the first one. This is easy to be done. A simple landmark that this position is right. When you have your X-ray, you should have the two femoral condyles not overlapped. All of us know that the medial femoral condyle is posteriorly prolonged than the lateral one. So for a true lateral view of the knee, these condyles should not be overlapped. If we have complete overlap for the condyles, this is an oblique view, not a lateral view. Another point for having the lateral view is we should have the knee nearly fully extended because this is the full or this is the functional position or the weight bearing position of the knee. If we look to the X-ray on the left side, uh, the technologist put the patient with the foot plantigrade. But the proper one is like the right one to have the knee fully extended and respective to the position of the foot to have the articular or weight bearing part of the knee. Again, we should have long film, including from the hip to the ankle. We should have distance of three meters and we should have the X-ray tube at the center of the knee. Taking the lateral view for the hip is easy. The affected or examined hip is touching the X-ray cassette and the hemipelvis is rotated outwards like this photo, the hemipelvis is rotated outwards 30 to 40 degrees to have the healthy or unneeded hip outside the X-ray field and having the lateral view of the hip. If there is no rotational deformity, we can have the central beam at the level of the knee and the measure on it. If not, we should elevate the X-ray tube up to be at the center of the hip. This is a separate lateral view for the hip and knee if we have torsional deformities. This is a photo or the diagram. The same position for the patient, but the X-ray tube is downwards for lateral view for the ankle and is upwards for the lateral view of the hip. This is very important to have the central perpendicular beams. For the ankle and the foot to have its lateral position, there is a little difference between the lateral view for the ankle and that of the foot. At first, we should have the foot and the ankle weight bearing or in the blunt grade position. The sole of the foot should be touching the cassette and we have a lateral view of the ankle. The two malleoli should be fully overlapped. If we have one malleolus in front of the other, this is a not this is not true lateral view for the ankle. This is an oblique one. To have this, we should internally rotate the foot about 10 degrees to have this full overlap and subsequently have the true lateral view for the ankle. This is lateral view of the foot. The foot is looking forward. There is no internal rotation and the beam of the X-ray is lower down to have central beams or central rays at the level of the ankle. This is for the foot. For the ankle, the same position of the X-ray tube, but we should internally rotate the foot 10 degrees to have it lateral view for the ankle. To conclude, for a short summary, the anteroposterior Radiographs are the standard. Standing is the ideal. 
the X-ray source should be positioned about three millimeter, three meters away. The film cassette should be long enough to include hips, knees, and ankles. This way we have magnification 5%. The X-ray beam should be centered on the joint of interest. In the operating room, we can do the, do the same with overlapping separate films with different magnification, but each film should have joint above and joint below. And don't forget to center the X-ray beam over the joint of interest. For true AB of the knee, patella is centered over the femoral condyles, irrespective to the position of the foot. Patients with fixed subluxation or dislocation, we use the plane of knee flexion extension axis. Through AP of the ankle and the hip, measured on the same knee forward radiograph, we have no torsional deformities. Otherwise, we should do separate ankle forward and separate hip forward radiographs. The true AB of the ankle is obtained with the foot pointing forward, irrespective to the position of the patella. True AB of the hip, with the hip rotated halfway between maximum external and internal rotation range of motion. For the knee lateral radiograph, femoral condyles are not overlapped. In the true lateral view of the ankle, the malleoli should be overlapping. And this is all. Thank you very much for all of you. Uh, if Thanks we have so uh, enough Professor time. Um, uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we would leave the questions at the end, uh, just not to... Uh, be late. Uh, so let's move to the uh, thank you for this uh, uh, very interesting talk because um, assessing proper x-ray planning on proper x-ray is the key for success otherwise you will be planning on the wrong way. Uh, so let's now move to the next speaker uh, Prof. Abdel Salam Abdel Alim. Uh, he will uh, speak about the gradual versus acute corrections the concepts and limitations. Uh, uh, I want first to express my uh, uh, my deep uh, appreciation and uh, great honor to be one of uh, the presenters in this uh, online teaching course and to be among the eminent figures of orthopedic surgeon, the surgery and uh, deformity correction. Uh, this topic is actually a very conflicting topic, which is we are, we are going to correct this deformity acutely or on a gradual basis. Uh, of course, acute correction is very tempting and is very uh, nice uh, for both the surgeon and the patient. The patient is coming out of OR uh, with a straight uh, limb and he's happy and uh, his problem is finally eliminated. And the surgeon is also, for this reason, is happy and is going to claim his fees. Um, however, this is limited to less severe deformities due to the limitations provided by the uh, tightness of the soft tissues and, of course, the dangers of uh, neurovascular uh, stretching injuries. On the other hand, the gradual correction tends to be safer uh, and allows for greater correction. <coughs> of course, the lovely acute correction is not without disadvantages. Uh, it starts by uh, the acute stretching of the neurovascular structures that can result in uh, compromise and uh, moreover, the acute stretch of the muscles, tendons, and fascia uh, can increase the uh, intraarticular uh, pressure and lead to extraarticular fractures, limitations of uh, the range of motion of the joints, and even compartmental syndrome. Uh, acute stretch of uh, the ligaments is a physical limiting factor for correction and leads to increased intraarticular pressure. Uh, moreover, the acute stretch of the skin can lead to scarring. Uh, stretch marks and uh, necrosis. And if the stretch is in the side of uh, the incision, uh, this will lead to wound dehiscence or contribute to infection. Uh, so uh, the question is uh, how much the magnitude of acute correction that can be tolerated by the neurovascular structures? Unfortunately, uh, it's not a set amount. This is a disappointing answer, of course, for the audience. Uh, however, we are going to explain why. Uh, it's much better to make a decision on a different basis. Uh, I mean, according to the personality of the deformity, it's variable from case to case. Uh, so there are several factors affected the tolerance to acute correction. And the different studies 
uh, reported variable mean degrees of achieved acute correction. So there is no consensus about the maximum amount of acute correction of a deformity. Uh, we, we can uh, collect these factors uh, into anatomical factors, uh, associated pathology, and uh, associated shortening or combined deformity. Uh, starting by the anatomical factors, we have a certain anatomical relationships, and especially uh, some neurovascular structures have um, tethering or limited course or uh, not relaxed course, like the common peroneal nerve. Uh, the, uh, it, it makes a sharp turn as it rounds uh, the neck of the fibula, and uh, it passes under the intercompartmental fascia, I mean the inter intermuscular septum between the lateral and the anterior compartments. So when this septum is pulled tight, it presses down on the deep peroneal nerve. Uh, also, the amount of acute stretch increases linearly with the radial distance from the echo. Uh, as in this example, we have this valgus uh, deformity. And of course, here, the uh, common peroneal nerve is more lateral than the bone itself. So the angle and the base of this angle is much less than at the level of the common peroneal nerve. Uh, the level of the osteotomy, acute proximal uh, tibial valgus to varus correction often leads to injury of this uh, common peroneal nerve, whereas the distal tibial valgus to varus correction have little effect on the uh, peroneal nerve. So the level of osteotomy is another anatomical factor. Uh, the actual or acquired redundancy of the neurovascular structures. I mean, when we have uh, a malunited fracture uh, provided in angulation and shortening, so the neurovascular structures are redundant, uh, while by time these, uh, this redundancy uh, becomes, uh, with adaptation becomes uh, short, and uh, this should be into, uh, taken into consideration when considering acute correction. Uh, the adjacent joint mobility is also a, a very important factor while uh, with acute correction of the deformity. Uh, as in this example, uh, we have a, a correction of this uh, uh, recurvatum, uh, sorry, uh, procurvatum deformity, uh, it makes a stretch on the uh, sciatic nerve, while the uh, movable or the mobile knee, uh, the knee flexion can release this uh, stretch. So the flexion of the knee relaxes all the parts of the sciatic nerve, and acute valgus to virus corrections in the uh, femur rarely leads to peroneal stretch injury because the knee can be flexed to protect the nerve. So acute corrections of the tibia, on the other hand, are not protected by the flexion of the knee because the relaxation occurs proximal to the tether point at the neck of the fibula. Uh, the associated pathology, uh, we have uh, previous scarring uh, around the neurovascular structures due to surgery or trauma. This decreases uh, the uh, compliance of these uh, soft tissues uh, and it could be a limiting factor for physical limiting factor for correction and uh, may increase the likelihood of a neurovascular injury. Uh, another associated pathology is presence of pony prominences such as osteochondroma uh, may tether the nearby nerve, as in this uh, example, this is an osteochondroma of the proximal fibula. It must be resected before correction of this valgus deformity. As in this example, the osteochondroma of the proximal fibula has been excised before correction of the deformity. The gradual correction of the deformity uh, basically uh, depends on the distraction osteogenesis, the uh, principle that was pioneered by Elizarov. Uh, that means the osseous structures respond to the gradual mechanical distraction with new bone formation. And uh, reflecting this to all soft tissues, this is called a distraction histogenesis. Uh, so with gradual correction, what's the order of deformity correction? If we have a combined deformity, we have uh, shortening, we have uh, angular deformity, we have rotation, we have translation. What's the sequence of a deformity correction? Uh, this is not a big issue with the uh, software programs uh, like uh, Tero Special Frame or uh, OrthoSolve or uh, Hexaboard or all uh, these uh, frames, uh, where uh, on the other hand, uh, when dealing with the uh, usual uh, or the ordinary uh, Elizar of circular frames, uh, this is with uh, this needs uh, special order. Uh, first, 
uh, if we don't have a risk of jamming or uh, collision, we start by correction of the angulation followed by lengthening, rotation, and translation. Uh, we start the correction of, uh, by angulation for by lengthening. Uh, we can do correction of angulation and lengthening at the same time by uh, proper placement of the hinges. Uh, this should be followed by the rotation and translation. If jamming is expected, we start by lengthening for distraction, just to free the, the bone ends, then uh, correction of angulation with lengthening, uh, followed by rotation, and the last is the translation. Uh, angulation, as we said, angulation correction and lengthening can be performed simultaneously. Uh, whereas I want to say that uh, rotational correction is most uh, easily performed between, between parallel rings. So uh, we, we postpone uh, rotational correction after correction of angulation uh, and lengthening if needed. Uh, moreover, it's very difficult to assess the torsional uh, element in the presence of uh, angulation. Um, just to apply an examples of this, uh, uh, like a case-based uh, learning, uh, this is uh, we have one plane symbol deformity uh, can be treated simply by plates and screws, and there are different forms of plates and screws. Uh, and also there's a fixator-assisted internal fixation, like in this example. The question, uh, do we need bone grafting or not? Well, uh, this is... Uh, little bit uh, conflicting issue and uh, uh, this systematic review uh, conducted by uh, uh, Sledin et al. Uh, concluded that uh, open wedge high TPL osteotomy with gaps smaller than 10 millimeters and rigid fixation might uh, be successfully managed without bone grafting. However, uh, when bone grafting is needed, it provides faster uh, rates of, uh, clinic, of clinical and radiographic uh, union. And another study concluded that uh, with uh, autogenous bone graft and uh, tricalcium phosphate, uh, the radiological bone union was, was faster. Well, we have a problem with the plates and screws that uh, the residual post-operative deformity uh, needs another uh, uh, solution, uh, another surgery. Uh, the residual post-operative deformity with plates and screws includes under-correction or over-correction or iatrogenic uh, deformity as anterior positioning of this uh, plate that affected the TPL slope. Uh, on the other hand, when using the uh, Elizaro fixator, uh, there is a possibility of fine-tuning of the post-operative uh, deformity. Uh, as, we hear, uh, as we see here, there's over-correction, but with gradual correction, uh, is feasible without uh, going back to the OR. Um, in this uh, complicated deformity, we have uh, a virus, uh, adolescent TB vara, a virus deformity, and uh, there's uh, also affected uh, TPL slope. As we see here, we, we draw the uh, axis of the proximal segment in the frontal plane and the axis of the distal segment, and this is the cora with an angle about 18 degrees virus. And in the lateral view, uh, we have a uh, uh, procurvatum of about 24 degrees. And obviously, we have a torsional internal tibial torsion. So we have a complicated uh, or complex uh, deformity, including this, uh, these three elements. Actually, they are not three elements, just only one angular deformity, because this is an oblique angle. And I think this, uh, this is discussed in uh, another lecture. And uh, by analyzing this deformity, we have 30 degrees in this oblique plane with the apex anterolateral. Uh, this is the after acute correction. Uh, this is a situation we, that we meet with the uh, acute correction, that we have acute stretch of uh, the uh, skin and soft tissues that needs sharp dissection around the uh, wires with release just to. Uh, release the soft tissues down to the bone, not only the skin. One of the merits uh, of the uh, Lizarov, in addition to the uh, post-operative gradual correction and the uh, fine tuning and early weight bearing, that we have a limited incision, very small incision, other, uh, which is different uh, than the technique required to uh, long plates or uh, plate-like tonal fix, uh, 
So this is just only uh, one to two centimeters of incision with preserving the periosteum. So uh, in these cases, we don't need actually bone grafting. So this is the uh, picture of union after complete healing without the need of any bone grafts. Early repairing and functional abuse is one of the advantages of uh, the circular frames uh, irrespective of the weight of the patient as we see here. Gradual correction examples, uh, several reports of uh, monoplanar fixators like this for correction of uh, gradual, uh, gradual uh, virus. Of course, the, uh, the software based programs uh, uh, like uh, Taylor Special Frame are very nice and uh, very easy to apply. Uh, however, when uh, we are going to, uh, take about, to talk about the current situation of the socioeconomic factors and the uh, financial burden on the patient, uh, this is a very limiting factor in uh, our country. However, we are all happy. Uh, this is an example of um, using the Elizar frame for correction of this uh, complex deformity. Uh, this complex deformity requires pre-operative planning and regular follow-up and the uh, preparation for possible uh, frame modifications. And then we start by pre-operative planning, of course, to uh, assess the femoral elements. The femur is normal, as we see here. So the tibia is the source of the deformity when we are going to check the cora, the angle is around 62 degrees in frontal plane and in the sagittal plane, we have an angle of about 41 degrees. When analyzing the, the plane of the deformity, uh, we have this uh, anterolateral uh, deformity of about 47 degrees. This is, these are the post-operative radiographs. Again, we are going to talk about the simple Elizaro frame. Uh, because we have uh, some uh, learning points to take from this uh, case. So this is an oblique plane deformity. We have only one distractor here. Uh, with, this is with progression of correction of the deformity. Uh, we have a situation here that we have uh, an exaggerated tickle stop. So uh, usually when we apply the fixator, when we apply the Elizar fixator, we usually put the rings to mimic the deformity. Uh, I mean, uh, we are we here to, to put the rings uh, perpendicular on this part and almost parallel to the TPL stop here. In this situation, if we uh, increase TPL stop when we apply the ring uh, parallel to the uh, upper TPL surface, it will impinge on the soft tissues of the cuff. Uh, of course, we know that we have at least uh, two fingers or around, or, or around between the soft tissues and the ring. Uh, and this is a problem. Uh, the other solution is to use a larger ring. However, this reduces significantly the uh, stability of the frame. Uh, there is another solution that we we use uh, an under correction of uh, this deformity uh, to use the proper size of the ring and to allow clearance of the soft tissues between the skin and the ring. However, with, with correction, with gradual correction of the deformity, it will impinge again against the uh, back of the thigh, preventing the range of motion and limiting uh, any further uh, correction of deformity. This is the practical example of the same case. As we see here, the ring impinges on the back of the thigh. In these cases, I prefer to use the carbon fiber rings Right, uh, the, to uh, allow for modifications. So uh, in this situation, we have different solutions. The first is to leave it. However, we, we cannot leave it actually because not yet uh, com completed the deformity. We still have virus here and the TPL slope is not yet corrected. And still we have uh, internal TPL torsion to be corrected. Uh, the other solution is the ring placement, re replacement. Uh, and this is very risky because we don't have strong uh, regenerate to make such replacement. And uh, the third solution is to cut the posterior ring. However, we cut the posterior ring just to leave it like this, it's not enough. We have we need a constrained uh, construct to uh, continue on the correction process. So the, uh, the other solution is, of course, we cut the posterior part and we applied this frame to keep the constraining 
uh, of uh, the proximal ring and to provide spaces for, uh, for further uh, uh, corrections of the deformity. Uh, the correction of uh, internal TPL torsion is the, uh, basically by the Elizarov, we need the rods to be uh, around the ring, as in this figure, not in the usual uh, vertical way, like this. So we have here a severe torsion, and we applied here the uh, 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 derotational construct. This is after correction of the internal TPL torsion. This is before correction of the torsion. However, we met with this surprise that we found or we faced a translational deformity. So why, why we have this translational deformity? This is actually not a surprise because when we apply the uh, Elizaro ring around the uh, leg, we apply it according to the soft tissues. So the bone is not in the center of the, of the ring. So when we are going to correct the deformity a translation will occur. So the last step, uh, as we remember before, we said the order of correction of the deformity, the last one was the translational correction of the deformity. This is before uh, correction of the translational deformity, and this is after the correction of the translational deformity, after frame removal. And this is clinical photos of the patient before and after range of motion of the right knee, range of motion of the left knee. This is the video of the patient before uh, correction of the deformity. And this is the follow-up video, sorry. And this is the follow-up video. Uh, almost two years after correction of the deformity. Okay, the uh, take home message is that decision making requires adequate and uh, adequate preoperative planning while taking into the consideration the various limiting factors for acute correction. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thanks so much, my dear uh, colleague and Professor Abdesalam, <laughs> Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Brandon University. Uh, it's, it's a very rich talk because you put the pros and cons of every world. Uh, we, as limb broken surgeons, we are not Elizar of surgeons. We can do internal fixation, external fixation, whatever. So you do, you, you do have to choose the, the best tool to, uh, to address the, uh, your patient's problem. Uh, so now let's um, go to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Duran Agam, consultant orthopedic surgeon, uh, Liverpool uh, 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 Hostel Trust, uh, my mentor and my uh, dear uh, friend. He will be talking about uh, software analysis and simulation. How would you do the planning through the software? Ahmed, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this meeting. Uh, my presentation is not about using software to perform a malalignment, malorientation test, but really a very general overview of how using software to uh, analyze the deformity and perform a simulation of correction is very important when you're dealing with any deformity from simple uh, to complex deformities. I have uh, no competing interest to disclose. So in treating any limb deformity, it is not the x-ray angles or the length measurements that are the most important thing, but it is how the problem of the deformity manifests itself. And there are really three uh, perspectives to how the problem manifests itself. There is a clinical, a radiological and a functional perspective to the problem. And if we fall into that common trap of just looking at the X-ray, measuring the X-ray and treating the deformity on the X-ray, then the only thing you can guarantee yourself at the end of the treatment is a nice X-ray, but you may not have in parallel a good, uh, a patient with good function or a patient with a good result clinically. 
So to, uh, to use, to follow on, what you need to do is to be able to propose a solution to the problem. But if you have experience in deformity analysis and you get that experience through practice, you are able to choose a solution that is able to provide maximum benefit through minimum surgical trauma, enhance recovery and rehabilitation, and also in today's world at a reasonable cost. So software analysis of deformity and simulation of correction by using the software allows you to look at different ways to solve the same problem. And it allows you through seeing these different ways to weigh the pros and cons of not just getting the perfect x-ray result, but looking at alternative results that are also examples of good treatment. Now, this is something many of the speakers in this symposium will remember. Drawing lines on plate films, using tracing paper and cutting tracing paper and moving those uh, outlines of the bones with the tracing paper to get a simulation of correction. And this wasn't very long ago, this was 30 years ago. But since then, we've had a digital revolution. In fact, from the late 1990s, a popular image manipulation software program, Photoshop, uh, introduced a ruler tool which allowed you to measure distance on an image and it allowed you to measure angles. So since the 1990s, the late 1990s, you were able to take a photograph of an x-ray, transfer it to Photoshop and perform the same measurements as long as that x-ray was calibrated, the same measurements that you would have done had you drawn those lines and angles on the x-ray itself. So that allowed a step forward in the process of deformity analysis. In fact, if you look at the timeline, uh, in 1998, this ruler tool was introduced in Photoshop, but roughly at the same time, whilst people, surgeons were taking photographs of x-rays and transferring them to the computer, roughly at the same time, a digital picture archiving and communication system, PAX, was being introduced in hospitals, where the entire uh, x-ray was in the digital domain. There was no uh, need for a plate film. And obviously this prompted uh, entrepreneurial companies to produce software. And examples for deformity analysis are TraumaCAD, uh, OrthoView, but there are many more now on the market since the early 2000s that allow you to template for arthroplasty surgery, for deformity analysis, for limb reconstruction. So now we are moving from the analog feel of drawing lines on x-rays and taking tracings of bone outlines into the digital domain where we're now working entirely uh, using software and digital images uh, on computers. But TraumaCAD and OrthoView were usually subscription only software packages and generally very, very expensive. In 2012, uh, a software app was launched on, uh, for use on the Apple operating system, Bone Ninja. Now, whilst this is not cheap, uh, today to, to get yourself using Bone Ninja, you would probably have to invest about 400 US uh, dollars in, in as much as you'd have to buy the cheapest iPad and then buy the software, which is about $50. So it is still uh, not inexpensive, but it allows you uh, with a app that is uh, specifically uh, programmed for deformity analysis to allow you to get work of analysis and simulation done uh, less expensively than in the proprietary software. There have been some studies comparing uh, the digital domain and the analog domain. So in this study in 2011, they compared doing measurements uh, directly on the x-ray film against doing it on packs. And the answer from the study was 
the results were equivalent. You could get as accurate measurements by measuring directly off the a calibrated X-ray as you can off PACS. But if you leave digital versus analog aside and move entirely into the digital domain, when you compare making measurements of PACS films and then compare with the measurements if you were to have a CT scan, uh, the interesting thing is they are very similar with the exception of making measurements on a film where the lines and the boundaries of the bones are not very clearly seen. And a good example is the posterior slope of the tibial plateau. You often have a double line and you have to choose which of those two lines really represents the plateau slope. And there you may make an error, whereas in a CT scan, uh, that's like, less likely to happen. With all these software programs, Photoshop, Bone Ninja, TraumaCAD, OrthoView, and the others, they simply allow you to draw straight lines and measure those lines on an image. It allows you to measure angles. It allows you to cut portions of the image and manipulate them as if to simulate a correction. So all these functions are present in all those programs. What these proprietary, when I say proprietary apps, I mean these apps that are designed specifically for deformity analysis and uh, simulation of correction. What they have over the general image manipulation programs like Photoshop is that they make the job quicker and easier. Very often they may have automatic uh, bony landmark detection like the ends of the femoral condyles or the width of the shaft. They have smart zoom features. And also, once you've drawn the main lines, uh, the reference axes and the tangents, the joint lines, they will generate the angles automatically. And also, it's very easy uh, to scale your measurements to the x-ray. Once you've calibrated the software, all your measurements will be to scale. However, these apps carry one significant disadvantage. They're not cheap. There is, however, for those who want to do deformity analysis, who want to do simulation of correction, a free alternative. And this program is available on all the platforms, Mac, PC, Linux. And if you set yourself to learning this program, it takes about two days to learn the tools and to learn how to navigate the screen. And once you have done that, you can apply your knowledge of the malalignment, malorientation tests using this software. And about six cases of doing this, you should be able to be comfortable in using it. And obviously, the more you do, the more expert you become. In comparison to the proprietary software, it takes longer. However, it is not without other advantages. You can bypass some of the uh, taking longer parts in the free software by drawing ready-made reference angles that you can import in and superimpose on your x-rays. Uh, you can also uh, vary the width of your reference lines, which is much more difficult to do with the proprietary software. And this allows you to increase the accuracy of your angular measurements. And one of the big advantages of uh, image manipulation programs like GIMP and Photoshop is that you can work in layers. And let me show you an example how layers can help you. Uh, this is an image of a, a high BMI patient uh, with miserable malalignment, uh, internal femoral torsion, external tibial torsion. If you look at the first x-ray on the left, you can see that the patient has been positioned, uh, as uh, Professor Alam said earlier, with the legs pointing forward. You can see that the patellae have not been centered. But in this standing position, you can see that the tibia is roughly shown in true AP, but the femur at the knee is in an oblique projection. When you repeat the x-ray uh, with the patella centered forward, you see the, the femur in a much better AP projection. But if you look at the tibia now, particularly at the ankle, you have an oblique ankle projection. However, the first image gave a good 
AP of the tibia. The second image gave a good AP of the femur. What has happened in the two images is you have positioned the patient to effectively cancel the malrotation. So with working with layers in software programs that give you the ability to work in layers, you can combine the two images, take the femur from one correct image, take the tibia from the other correct image, combine them, and now you have removed the effect of the malrotation. And you can see for yourself then whether there is a true angular deformity present in the femur or the tibia. Here you have an AP femur, AP tibia. What we must remember with uh, deformity correction is that whatever you do, whichever software you use, the important thing is that after you have performed your simulation of correction, what you have achieved is just corrected the x-ray abnormalities in one plane of projection. You have not provided a treatment plan. You have just perform a simulation of treatment by x-ray. And this doesn't necessarily offer a solution to the patient's problem. So this is where simulation of correction can be taken one step further. First, perform the correction using the malalignment test, malorientation test, getting your corers, doing your bisectors, doing your osteotomies, following your rules of your osteotomies, and getting your axis realigned. That is the perfect radiological correction. Then pause and ask yourself two questions. First, can you achieve a similar correction, similar, not the same, but with the number of osteotomies reduced, especially if this is multi-level surgery? And the second question you need to ask yourself is, for each osteotomy, can I actually change the location of the osteotomy to a part of the bone so that I get more predictable and better healing? This is taking your simulation of correction to the next level, not just doing the correction to get that perfect x-ray. You can also look at the different strategies and say, can I choose a method of fixation that offers better rehabilitation? I may have a choice, circular fixator, monolateral fixator, internal fixation by intramedullary nail or by plate. Which method in this case offers better facilitation? And then you will have usually two strategies or three strategies even in the more complicated cases. Look at those strategies and say, which one and what are their costs in terms of theater time, inpatient, outpatient, the cost of the fixation device, and also importantly, the impact on the patient. Your different treatment strategies will impact the patient, particularly in time of work. So I will just show one example to show how simulation of correction can be done more than once and offer different treatment strategies. Here is a uh, complex deformity. Uh, this is a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta, but it's an ambulatory, independent ambulator. And if you just look at the femur, let's not look at all the deformities, let's look at the right femur. You can see that the right femur has got a curve in the coronal projection and in the sagittal projection. In the coronal projection, there is a resolution cora and a cora one and cora two. In the lateral or sagittal projection, there is also a resolution cora and a cora one and a cora two. So at a minimum, if we want to get the perfect x-ray, we would need three osteotomies, two diaphyseal and one distal femoral periarticular osteotomy to get a nail to go into and correct this deformity. However, is this the only strategy? Remember, this patient has got a longer leg on this side. So open wedge osteotomies at multiple levels may not be the best thing for this patient because you will increase the length difference even more. So what are the alternatives? Well, here you can see in the middle image, 
we have done an osteotomy at the resolution cora and not at cora one, cora two. We have taken a cuneiform trapezoidal wedge shape to shorten the femur to enable a correction in the lateral view that restores the axis. In the AP view, the only way we can accommodate this correction is by using a rule two. So there is translation at the osteotomy to enable a realignment of the mechanical axis. The AP view will not allow an intramedullary nail, the lateral view here. So here we can consider alternative methods of stabilization that may not necessarily involve an intramedullary nail. So in this particular case, we used submuscular plating to accommodate the correction, to avoid doing three osteotomies, to do it in one osteotomy, to achieve a shortening as this leg was longer, and importantly, to reduce the impact of surgery. And as you can see here, when we did the tibia as well, we were able to restore the mechanical axis on this side. So to conclude, what I'm hoping to show by this presentation is not to stop at your analysis of deformity using software. I've mentioned that there is uh, available uh, software that is free for you to use to be able to do deformity analysis and simulation of correction, but not just to stop at obtaining the perfect x-ray, but to look at, especially in multi-level surgery and complex surgery, considering reducing the number of osteotomies, looking at whether you can position your osteotomies in places where the healing is more predictable and better, and whether you can consider different methods of stabilization that can uh, influence the recovery of the patient and reduce the impact of surgery on the patient track. Very much today, rather than say 20 years ago when we were learning, 30 years ago when we were learning, learning the Elizarov method, today what we can do is learn about optimizing treatment in terms of reducing the invasiveness, reducing the recovery period, and also reducing uh, the cost. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mr. Nagan, for this wonderful talk. It's, uh, uh, it's how would you look at the bigger picture, not only the proper X-ray or the proper lines, but the whole picture. So I uh, hope that uh, everyone has uh, got much of this. Uh, so let's uh, move to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Nicholas Giutakis, uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon, Liverpool Limbricon Unit. Uh, he will be uh, talking about the acute corrections of the tibia by the external fixator assisted technique. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, I will proceed with sharing my screen, hopefully without too many problems. Uh, let me know if uh, if the presentation is visible. Sure. Yes, that's it. Uh, hopefully in the correct mode. And full screen, that's so, it. Uh, so the goal uh, of my talk will be to illustrate a technique that has been widely used in our unit for some years now on, uh, on correcting deformities using um, external, fixa external fixation as a tool um, that assists an acute correction while we, we use the internal fixation as the definitive method. We have heard from uh, the previous speakers, uh, Professor Ahmed in particular, um, uh, uh, also on the uh, on the um, uh, issues with acute correction, on how um, uh, or how many limitations there are, and, all, and, and we're all aware that gradual correction and the uh, use of external fixation, particular circular frames, are a pretty safe bet on on achieving the goal. Um, so, what really is the is the motivation on on using acute uh, acute corrections? Well, um, although the results can be quite predictable and successful with uh, with uh, external fixation, we're all aware of of the burden to patients, uh, the length of treatment, and therefore there is a drive on trying to improve um, the quality of care and and the experience for. Uh, as much as possible. So 
We have been using, as I mentioned earlier, this technique for a number of years, and I will proceed to show you um, to show you the method. Um, these are some disclosures, relevant or not so relevant to the talk, possibly some of them, uh, some more than others. So um, I will illustrate the steps of the technique, and ultimately, these are um, the fact that we use an external fixator to correct the deformity acutely. Uh, then we proceed to use internal fixation. It can be a plate, it can be a nail around the external fixator pins. Then we remove the external fixator after internal fixation has been performed. And we rely on the internal fixation implant to maintain the correction. So, um, the whole principle of, of this uh, method of correction lies on placing our half pins against the anatomical axis. And on that way, we exploit the, what we call the virtual hinge. So uh, in the moment we have successfully placed our pins perpendicularly uh, above and below the level of the osteotomy, manipulation of the pins should correct the deformity. So um, the pins uh, are orthogonally placed on an against the anatomical axis, both at the proximal and, at the dist and distally to the proposed level of the osteotomy. Uh, my talk is focusing on the tibia and therefore commenting on anatomical axis is probably less relevant because as we learned yesterday, anatomical and mechanical axis in the tibia are parallel. But I'm, I think it's very important to remember the concept of anatomical axis because when, as we'll hear later on the talk uh, by uh, Professor Sarma on the femoral connections, there, there will be a lot more relevant. So there is a difference as we heard yesterday between anatomical and mechanical axis in the femur. So therefore I invite, I invite all delegates to stick on in their memory the concept of orthogonal pins to the anatomical axis. So uh, it is important, obviously, that our pins are placed outside of the path of, intended, of the intended internal fixation. So uh, we don't want the uh, half pins to interfere with the placement of a nail or the plate. And uh, ultimately, they perform an acute manipulation of pins to make them parallel after the osteotomy. I will show this on a, gra on a graphical uh, uh, mode. So, um, We've learned how to draw the anatomical, uh, the anatomical and mechanical is the same as we said yesterday, uh, parallel on the tibia. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward for a in, in, in the case of a diaphyseal osteotomy where um, the mid diaphyseal lines are easy to identify and it's quite simple in placing our pins 90 degrees in the diaphysis. So by doing so proximally and distally, we can see by many by placing the pins parallel, how we achieve correction of the deformity. Very simple illustration of diaphysis. Things become a little bit more complex when we come to treat metaphysial deformities and they actually tend to be more common than diaphysial deformities. Um, so it's again, this drawing the anatomical axis in the diaphysis is quite straightforward. When you get in close to the knee joint is more complicated. So we have to draw the joint orientation angle uh, and we have to use the MPTA, which is 87 degrees in the tibia as we learned yesterday. So there is a slight diver divergence. There are three degrees of divergence. We have to remember that because we have to place our pins perpendicular to the axis. And in this case, they will be not, not exactly parallel to the knee joint. We have to factor the three degrees um, that we are aware is part of uh, what the normal angle is. So if we do that, we can see the pins are convergent. And once we perform the osteotomy and we place the pins parallel, we should have obtained correction of the deformity. Now, um, drawing the um, um, anatomical axis, um, we can draw this on the lateral view. And it doesn't matter whether you place your pins on the sagittal plane or uh, in, in the middle or behind, or whether you place them um, on the coronal plane. 
against the coronal plane. So as long as they're perpendicular to the axis, you can, you can um, achieve the result really to correct your deformity. So I've shown the, these different modes of placement because they affect, um, they affect obviously where you're gonna place your internal fixation implants. So I'll, I will show you some clinical uh, examples of application now, tibial diaphyseal deformity. Um, we discussed the, um, the method of perpendicular placement of uh, pins. So here are the pins on the distal tibia, and these are placed posteriorly because the, the plan here is to use an intramedullary nail as the definitive method of uh, fixation. So therefore, the pins have to be placed uh, outside the path. You can see how these uh, clamps are radio loosened and allow you to visualize uh, the tibia. And also, uh, you can use the, the profile of the clamp versus the posterior um, the posterior axis of the uh, the posterior cortex of the tibia and make, by making them parallel then you know that you have placed your pins in line so these are the this is the position of the distal pins higher up uh, we are aiming to place our proximal pins again the method is the same you look at the profile of the clamp and the posterior uh, axis of the tibia, which are uh, collinear. So this way we have placed the pins posteriorly to the entry uh, point of the nail and the trajectory of placement of the nail. The osteotomy has been performed. Manipulation of the pins prior to insertion of the nail and uh, in nail insertion um, in a satisfactory position and correction of deformity has been achieved. So what about the periarticular deformity? So we'll show you now a case of a, a varus of the tibia. And again, we have to draw our angles. So we need the uh, MPTA, we need to draw the joint orientation angles uh, of the proximal tibia and also the distal. Here you can use a mid diaphyseal line Now, in this instance, in this case, we're using the uh, a dome osteotomy. So this is the cora, uh, where you can see the intersection of the two lines. And ideally, where the cora is should be the center of rotation and angulation. So um, the, the way this method works is by placing uh, the, a pin exactly where you want the center of the uh, deformity to rotate. And then you can perform using, using a Rancho cube from the Elizarov uh, tray. You can use your, um, your uh, uh, perform the drill, uh, drilling of the osteotomy as we've heard yesterday on the osteotomy talk. And um, then place, in this case, we're placing our pins prior to completing the osteotomy. And I, I point your attention to the fact that the pins are not parallel to the to the uh, knee joint, to the articular surface of the tibia, but they factor these three degrees um, as much as possible. Obviously, it's it's within the you know the limit of uh, of our ability to judge these angles. It's not essential to be spot on three degrees, but uh, if you take into account the small convergence, then you are more likely to get your correction uh, spot on. In the diaphysis, it's more simple. You place the pins. We place our pins perpendicular to the anatomical axis of the shaft. So here you can see um, now the osteotomy corrected, around, rotating around the, uh, the dome, and it's a muscular placement of a plate on the opposite side. So in, if you notice in this case, your external fixator is placed on the medial side, away from the path of uh, intended placement of the internal fixation implant. Okay, and this is the uh, final result after union. In the distal tibia, uh, less commonly we tend to use internal fixation, but in, in instances where uh, this is deemed safe, it can be a, a powerful method. Um, so this is a, a distal tibial virus. Very, 
that the formula is very close to the knee joint, to the ankle joint. You can see again the intention of performing a dome osteotomy. So we place the pin exactly where the core is. The, the next step will be placing your external fixator pins perpendicular to the axis. So in this case, are parallel to the ankle joint. Well, approximately will be perpendicular to um, perpendicular to the diaphysis. Correction performed by manipulating the pins, and then we have uh, the final correction with uh, maintained by the plate. I will show you a case which uh, I will go very fast through the femur because this is not relevant to this talk, but is a, a complex case of, of uh, 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 the deformity of both tibia and uh, femur. It's an oblique plane deformity in this case, as you can see, both on the AP and the lateral view. The tibia is an oblique plane deformity, while the femur is one plane. The femur, uh, you will hear more about it on the next talk, has been corrected with the same method and stabilized with a uh, with the intermediary nail. In this case, the tibia um, is, we will aim an, an external fixator correction and use, and use a plate. So you can see how uh, we identify the uh, angles. In the, on the lateral view, ideally, ideally the, we factoring, we can factor the 10 degrees uh, in this case, we will not, and I will explain why in a second. So uh, the pin for uh, the purpose of, of, again, as we saw earlier on, on uh, drawing our dome osteotomy, the two pins here have been placed parallel to uh, the uh, knee joint. And we know, we, we know that the, uh, on the lateral view, on the sides that plane, the uh, angle is actually 80 degrees, is not 90. But in this case, because we want to match the hyperextension uh, at the end of the correction, we know that we have to factor uh, less than 10 degrees of correction. So we don't want to perform a full radiological correction. Otherwise, the patient will not have a, a clinically a, a, the correct hyperextension to match also the opposite side. pins placed at 90 degrees, and then correction perform an external fixator assisted method uh, with providing the, the uh, desired radiological and clinical uh, outcome. So as I was explaining earlier, we're not aiming for uh, deliberately, we're not aiming to correct fully the deformity of the sagittal plane in order to match the hyperextension properly. Otherwise, this patient will have a, a slight flex flexion deformity. And these are the uh, these are the uh, images of healing. So, what are the requirements really um, for us to perform safely this type of surgery? And the ultimately, in terms of the surgeon, from the surgeon's perspective, is uh, one is the ability on on identifying and placing the external fixator pins at ninety degrees to the anatomical axis, and also have some familiarity with minimally invasive. Uh, internal fixation techniques. What are the inconveniences is that you intraoperatively you have to shave uh, after you perform your correction with the external fixator, you have to save your images into the pack system. You have you may have to describe when measure the angles, then rescribe, or otherwise trust whoever, one of you know your colleagues who will measure them for you. Um, and then proceed once you you are satisfied that you have um, that you have achieved a good correction with the external fixator. Then you can proceed to insert your internal fixation implant. Otherwise, you you um, you may have to make some adjustments. In terms of the type of fixator we need to use, I, you need an external fixator that al allows you to place the pins through standard clamps at 90 degrees. So you need um, quite a rigid clamps such as a, a rail type of system. And also uh, uh, ha uh, have access to special clamps that can factor uh, the certain degrees of, of, 
uh, of angulation. So three degrees in the tibia, 10 degrees in the femur, and then depending on the plane, different, different angles. You need to be able to fix these clamps in a position that will maintain uh, maintain the uh, angles that you wish and then and then manipulate the pins. So you have in the tibia the three degrees uh, proximally on the AP and 10 degrees on the sagittal plane. You need to have your external fixator system needs to allow you also to fine tune um, the uh, position of the pins after the initial correction. In case you're not happy, you want to increase a little bit your angles, you need to have a uh, a good control. Therefore, this is not uh, a, a typical bar clamp fixator. It's not ideal in that respect because uh, largely it will allow you to perform the correction, but it will not allow you to fine tune the position. Also, um, you need an external fixator that provides the ability to compress the sternum. Um, now, in terms of patient requirements, we have heard most of this before on the talk on acute correction, the limitations. So we have to take into account the type and extent of a deformity. Um, we need to know uh, whether there are any soft tissue problems, if there's extensive scarring from previous injuries or surgery um, that will preclude, could preclude the patient being suitable for an acute correction. Certainly neurovascular considerations, particularly the common peroneal nerve. Certainly the type of host will matter. So if you have a vasculopathic patient, an acute correction may not be uh, appropriate. What can be a solution? What can be an additional tool that enable us to perform ac these acute corrections uh, is primarily a performing peroneal nerve release. And this is indicated in large acute corrections such as valgus, procurvatum, and uh, external rotation. So if you move from valgus to varus, procurvatum to neutral and external to internal rotation, then the common peroneal nerve will go into tension and we need to perform a release before the correction. So that in these cases, the peroneal nerve release will be the first step uh, of the surgical procedure. I will illustrate this uh, technique uh, that has, uh, has been popularized in Liverpool by Durai and we have all adopted it. Um, it's a, it requires an incision along the posterior border of the fibula, which is quite straightforward to identify. The next step will be to identify the interval between the posterior edge of the peroneus long, longus and the lateral head of gastroc. Once you've found that plane, then you're, you're, the, the next structure you will find will be the, the uh, first branch of, of the peroneal nerve to the peroneus longus muscle. At that point, once you've identified uh, the branch, you uh, identify the origin, you follow the peroneus longus to the fibular head and you detach the peroneus longus from the fibular head and that will bring into the full view the superficial branch of the peroneal nerve. The next step, once you found the superficial uh, branch of the peroneal nerve will be to divide peroneus longus. So as you can see here, the two ends of the muscle and, and immediately underneath, you will find the, the deep peroneal nerve. And uh, at this point, you're, you're, um, you can complete your release. Extra considerations. Um, uh, in the proximal tibia, intramedullary nails don't tend to work as well. Uh, they are not very good at controlling correction, so we don't use them. We use lateral submuscular plates. Our results have been presented. These are figures only referring to the tibia uh, in keeping with my talk. Um, these have been presented in 2018 at the SAMI and the, uh, out of 23 tibial corrections, you can see we use uh, predominantly plates. One uh, residual deformity only, uh, which was five degrees actually, not more than five was exactly five degrees. Uh, and that was factor because we, there was an issue with the deformity not accumulating the, the shape of the plate. So we agreed uh, beforehand that that will be accepted. There have been no uh, cases of nerve palsy out of the 23, no infections. And the only additional procedure were two plate removals for irritation. One of which you have seen, it was the distal tibia plate. So, and to conclude the external fixator assisted correction provides uh, in our experience, control and precision. We use the anatomical axis, anatomic axis, and 
the concept of perpendicular pin placement to an anatomical axis as the main, the main step to achieve this correction, to help us achieve the correction. And through uh, um, the appropriate type of external fixator who can control contact and fine tune the reduction, making sure that pins are away from internal fixation paths, performing the nerve release when indicated, and there are economic, significant economical advantages because you, the fixator is reused every time. You only have to um, uh, factor the cost of the half pins that are, are used improperly. Is this less accurate? Uh, it is not if you check your alignment before internal fixation. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, your attention. Um, I can take it maybe any questions on uh, on the platform later. I will answer them to your delegates. You can proceed maybe with the next talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Jitakis, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Yeah, Prof. Alam, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Nicholas. Very okay. nice topic with, with illustrations. Thank you. Now it's the turn of Mr. Sharma. Professor of Orthopedics at Hull University. Welcome, Mr. Sharma. Are you ready? Yeah. Can you start, please? Right. Can everybody yes, hear me? Yes, And you can see the screen? Yes, we see it. Perfect. Lovely. Right. So um, I'm sorry, I joined a bit late. Uh, uh, so um, some things you might have already heard and you might have a bit of a re repetition, but I always think repetition is, is never a bad idea. Uh, my remit today uh, is about uh, uh, fixed assisted internal fixation in femur. Um, uh, Nikos has very beautifully covered the tibia and uh, I think there are some talks about the principles as well. So I won't cover a lot. Um, so in this, uh, I um, will be talking uh, very little about the nailing this reason I put it down, but principally about the pl uh, plating because I do that more. And, uh, but we'll talk about the technique and some basics about it. Osteotomy rules, just to remind you that you, we have already talked about it, so therefore we won't talk about it again, but just to remember that's a very important part of this. Now, why we do internal fixation? is principally is because it's very easy for patient and especially in femur, because uh, as you know that uh, external fixation pins are very, very uncomfortable for patient, very painful, and therefore it's always, internal fixation is always better. Uh, but we have to remember that we have to individualize surgery for individual patients. Every patient should have a customized surgery according to, to, to their needs and the deformity factors. And then we can plan that what is the best implant. Uh, it may vary from plate to the nail or, or maybe sometimes a, 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 a two-stage procedure, but it has to be individualized to the problem. Why we want to do fixed assisted? because we have good control of the each of the segments. A fixation therefore becomes easier and we can get to the alignment exactly what we want. I also tend to do uh, add navigation into all my fixed assisted internal fixations because I think this improves the accuracy quite significantly and it's actually pretty good and helpful. As yet, there is no purpose-built platform, so I have to utilize total knee replacement or, or HTO software. And I must emphasize that it only provides the over, overall me mechanical access uh, accuracy, and therefore anything else, anything else, if you're looking for it, then it won't be possible. There are a number of factors we need to consider, and I'm sure you would have talked about this before, so I won't spend too much time on it, but we need to especially consider the soft tissue, the hardware, what you're going to use, and importantly, what translation you're going to get and how you're going to balance that translation with your fixation device. And 
Is it a single level or multiple level surgery? I'm only talking about the single level because the multiple level surgery would be uh, followed in the next talk by Mr. Nayagam. In the implants, what are we going to use? Generally, plates are pretty good for, for, for metaphysis and uh, nails can be used for, 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 for diaphysis. Uh, um, um, this is pretty good for that. And in, and in metaphysis, nails can be used depending on how much translation you're going to get. And therefore it's quite important to, to pre-plan this uh, before. Now, as you will, uh, we, we all know by, by experience that often you'll find that Cora uh, is quite close to the joint and it's the, therefore the osteotomy has to be a bit away and therefore we have to use rule two, which means there's an obligatory translation like in this case. And therefore it's quite important that we incorporate a translation in, in, into a fixation uh, planning and what implant uh, we're going to use. So the other important thing is where, where, where are we going to use the uh, put up pins? So if as, uh, Nikos has nicely showed in his pictures, in his x-rays, that the pins has to be placed away from the plane of fixation. So if you're using a nail in the femur, then it can go posterior. And the advantage of that, and then approximately, if you're going to, uh, your proximal pins needs to be far away from the length of the nail or a plate. So for example, in this case, if you're using a nail, your nail will finish somewhere here. So your pins has to be proximal to that. Here, these pins has to be posterior and quite, you, you can correct it and then decide where you're going to go. And remember, if you're going to nail it, your, your entry point may not be the same. And uh, uh, the, the, therefore you have to pre-plan it to ensure that you make the right entry point so your, uh, so your, your implant is in right position and holds the deformity. There are a number of uh, methods uh, to use and uh, elizor assisted monolateral, uh, hexapod assisted is not very common, but it's expensive. And I, I don't personally think it's, a, it's, it's very helpful apart from few very complex de deformities. Now the principles are quite important. The most important thing is we need to align each ring to its respective segments so instead to be perpendicular and in the right plane, anatomical or mechanical, you need to decide which plane you're correcting. Then you plan the osteotomy and then we expect that each time we, we, we put our hinge at the core and therefore it will translate appropriately. We check your alignment and then we stabilize with either plate or a nail. So I'm going to show you some techniques. And so this is the technique about uh, using elizor of hinge. So I'll mark my joint line. Where is the distal end of the plate is going to go? This is my osteotomy site. And these are the two areas that if I have to have a six hole or eight hole plate, where will they finish? And then so my, so, so my pins has to be proximally where away from the space of the plate, uh, from where the plate is. Then I make my frame. It's important to leave the space open. If you're going to use a plate, then you need to put a two third ring. So that all this space is open for you to put in the plate. Uh, and there is, uh, so your uh, ring is not in your way and you put your hinge accordingly where you're going to put. And once you put it on, so you see, my both the pins are, uh, are are well away here. I'm going to use a six hole plate. I've got plenty of space here. And these are the computer trackers, the, the navigation trackers. And what they do is, so you have to do um, uh, uh, with the software, with the TKR software, you need to do some basic preparation about identifying ankle, hip, and the central of and the center of the hip. So you need to do all that. Um, and then, the, then they're quite helpful in helping you in the overall alignment. So here, my other two pins are on the other side. So there's nothing in the way of the plate. So on the medial side, 
the, these are the two pins and these are the computer trackers again which see uh, from the median side now this is not the same patient but you must remember as i said the aligning of the each ring to its respective segment so this is the hinge of the cora but these this ring is perpendicular to this segment and with the long rod i can uh, i pl i put this ring into the correct axis of the distal segment proximally again this ring is perpendicular and this long rod will give me will help me place this pin into the correct alignment of the proximal segment it depends whether you use anatomical or, or mechanical but it should be so whichever segment you're using it should be aligned appropriately and this is the another view of showing that how to align the each ring to its uh, uh, perpendicular to its own segment then in this case i'm doing a closing wedge osteotomy so i put in two uh, wires between them i'm going to use my osteotomy uh, you may make an incision through the osteotomy and and this is the some pictures intraoperative pictures from the uh, um uh, sh sh showing how the computer navigation helps so uh, again this is a, a different patient from the what i'm showing so so the, in a pre operative picture uh, image you can see there's about 16 degrees of varus and what i really want to put in this is the post operative this one i want to put it in 3 degrees of valgus correcting the deformity so 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 what it does is it tells you all about the axis and you can put the correct axis and lock it and then this is is very helpful here so i have now my plate is inside there i put in the screws and stabilize it happy with it and this is the end product i've taken the fixator off pictures if you see this is the pre operative picture this was my initial planning and uh here is the picture and and you have to say uh, it is a slightly undercorrected as uh, according to the plan and this is because the lack of translation despite everything i thought i've corrected but haven't so still if we, with this there is a slight issue sometimes can happen but overall mechanical axis here is is within the normal limits although it's slightly undercorrected now how do we measure the inter intra operative mechanical axis so there are a number of methods one is the diathermy method so this is an uh, a lateral compartment osteoarthritis in a young patient where you need to correct the deformity and this is the diathermy method so you put your uh, diathermy in the center of the hip to the center of the ankle and it should pass in the center of the knee or where of the area where you want in this case i over corrected it put it slightly medial uh, this axis and in the same way the, this is from the computer navigation there about 7 degrees valgus pre operatively and my axis was about uh, 60% on the lateral side on the plateau once i've corrected it which is the intraoperative picture there if you see from the diathermy method it is corrected and this is where my axis is slightly in internally where i wanted and this is the picture where it shows that this is th about a third inside and this is corresponds to the picture uh, to the plan which i wanted pre operatively then there is a, another device uh, which is a monolateral sorry unicortical fixator is a, 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 a called unico and i've done quite a few with these the advantage of the system is it is because pins are monocortical and therefore you can put it in in the presence of other implants like hip or knee replacements and also <coughs> excuse me and also um uh, it the application is very quick because uh what happens is that there is a um there is a self restricting device and what it does is you can't drill this pin more uh, than it is intended to so it stays in in the single cortex and doesn't penetrate apart from occasionally it does do in the in the soft metaphyseal bone where you got to be careful 
but otherwise, so you can put the whole fixed in, in about uh, between 10 to 15 minutes and then uh, carry on with your uh, rest of the operation. So this is an example of a patient who had a valgus deformity and, and this was the initial planning to correct it. And this is the preoperative pictures. And again, this is the planning where I'm going to put uh, my plate and everything uh, there. And then here, as Nikos showed you nicely, there's another example of the dome osteotomy, which do with the, you put in a fixator, then you, you put in a, a, a rancho and you move the rancho and uh, that will create the, uh, your deformity, sorry, your osteotomy. But uh, at this point, we leave, I leave this and then we put a fixator. So as you can see, it is a unicortical fixator. All the pins are just unicortical here and it the, and that each uh, segment has four pins, they go on very quickly. And this is a different patient, but just to show you that this is a hip replacement coming here and your pins are still clear of this uh, 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 prosthesis. Uh, and even in the presence of a nail or a prosthesis, you, you can put this fixator on. And here is the uh, picture, I have to say it's not a very pretty picture. I should have cleaned the leg properly to take the picture. And from the pre-op uh, picture, you can see this is the post-op uh, where, where I've corrected it. Once I've corrected it, then I, I check my access with the diathermy method. This is where I want my access to be. And then I put in this rod and lock it. It, it just uh, two um, nuts which, which locks it and it becomes quite stable. And these are the computer navigation uh, trackers here again uh, to double check it with the fixator. And then uh, once we put this on, uh, uh, I can open it up and, and put my plate on. So this is the preoperative picture. That's the postoperative picture. And this is the mechanical axis. This is where uh, we I intended and it's come corrected and it's corrected. These are the final pictures with the knee flexion uh, postoperatively. Then sometimes you need to have a very pragmatic approach in this 32 year old patient had a number of problems, pre previous PFFD, number of shortenings, uh, sorry, number of uh, lengthening surgeries and uh, uh, mechanical access quite lateral. Now at 32, she has grade four lateral OA, knee flexion is limited, valgus hind foot uh, with a fixed previous triple fusion, severe osteoarthritis of the hip. So multiple problems. Here we were, my aim is to just make the mechanical access straight. Um, she needs a knee replacement soon. So my aim is not to do any complex or fancy surgery. Here I use the uh, monolateral device, the uh, autofix one. I have to say, I don't use it a lot uh, because uh, I find it uh, hard to do the fine tuning. So I tend to use the hinges or the, or the, or the Unico more uh, than this. In this case, I use it. And again, as you can see, the pins are posterior to the plane where uh, of the nail. And there are, um, now this is quite important that how you put these pins. Mr. Nigam shows beautifully in his, in his talks. And it's important that you must remember that uh, anatomical axis is about 10, 10 degrees of the mechanical axis. So you have to put the planes, these pins appropriately because you may under you may end up over correcting it or under correcting it. So you need to put it, decide which plane you're going to put your pins in and correct appropriately. Uh, and that way you can get the uh, appropriate correction. Orthofix device has actually a device in a, in a templating device where you can put the wires and you can put the half pins uh, parallel to this uh, wire. Then again, proximally, it, it is away from the length of the nail. And uh, then uh, just a standard uh, compression nail, uh, which I put in proximal locking, distal locking. And this is the uh, come straight. And, and this is the nail screws are bent because of my compression. And the plan was to correct it and then do uh, a, a hex support to get access straight. And then so that when she comes for hip and knee replacement, she will be, her access would be straight. That was the plan. So in summary, it does increase the surgical time. 
and you have to be a bit, a bit more patient and uh, and the plan it appropriately and your so your pre-operative time improves as well. There is an element of, of rebound phenomena of the because of the muscles. So if your your fixator is not strong enough, you might end up with an undercorrection of the deformity despite you correcting it initially fully. So you have to be a bit careful. And if required, you need to put up uh, more, more robust fixation. And you need to leave enough space for your hardware uh, between the two. So your, uh, your X-fix and your nail or plate jig, there should be enough space for that. And uh, your pins should not become a, in the way of the nail of the plate as well. So it's quite important to plan that. So just follow the principles of the deformity correction because that's important. As I, and as I said, pre-planning is crucial because there's an element of translation which you need to incorporate in your planning and correction and fixation. And you only get one chance. You cannot come back post-operatively and correct it. So you have to get it right the first time around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Professor Sharma. Thank you. Uh, back again to Mr. Durai Naigam and another talk about complex deformities. Is that all right? Yes. Good, thank you. So okay. I'm going to just expand a little bit on what Mr. Jotakis and Professor Sharma have talked about, which is about acute corrections. They've covered the femur and the tibia, and I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, multi-level deformities. So Mr. Nagam, we can see the, we see the presenter view, sorry. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if we're talking about single level acute corrections of deformity, then you have to consider four very important points. You have to do your analysis and you have to do your simulation using tracing paper or using uh, software digital techniques. You must always with acute correction, consider the structures at risk especially the direction and the magnitude of correction, which may produce sudden increases in tension on these structures at risk. Always be aware that if the limb has got evidence of scarring, your boundaries of acute correction start to decrease significantly. And finally, uh, it's important that if you're doing osteotomies with acute correction and you are not going to use augmentive techniques like bone graph or BMP or uh, biologics, perform the osteotomies biologically and make sure you try to preserve the biology and at the end of the operation, preserve the contact between the fragments, between the sides uh, of the osteotomy. So these are key four points for acute correction for single level. In multi-level, it is exactly the same, all the same, points apply for multi-level at each level as they do for single level acute corrections. Now we've heard already that the X-fix control of correction uh, can be done using a hexapod and uh, Professor Sharma introduced or rather mentioned uh, the chaos technique which is computer hexapod assisted orthopedic surgery. Um, but uh, in Liverpool we have uh, quite significant experience using rail fixators to do acute correction. Uh, one of the consultants in Liverpool has coined the acronym, instead of chaos, this is order, uh, osteosynthesis and resolution of deformity using an external rail. And uh, I think it's actually a very good acronym because it contrasts with uh, chaos. The monolateral option has significant advantages, and I will show them in this presentation. Um, first of all, if you used a hexapod and 
you didn't get uh, the correction you needed at first go, and you needed to uh, program new strut lengths to get further correction, you would have to take the parameters or uh, go back to the, the, to the computer and get new strut settings in order to get fine tuning the correction. With a monolateral, as long as you've got the right combination of clams to allow angular or translational adjustments, you can do it on spec right there and then, and then do your check x-rays to see if you've got the correction. Furthermore, being a monolateral, it's very easy for uh, the monolateral to be out of the way for intraoperative imaging. Obviously, with a circular fixator, whether it's a Lazaro or a hexapod, there are more bits of metal that can get in the way of clear intraoperative imaging. Whichever technique, circular or monolateral, you need to do your planning. You need to understand the rules of osteotomy. And as mentioned by the previous speakers, you've got to think about where your x fix pins are going because they've got to stay out of the way of the trajectory of your intended internal fixation implant, be it nail, plate, whatever. So I've used this example in a previous talk, not today, but to show this is a complex deformity in an adult patient post uh, lengthening for a similar condition, uh, congenital short femur with a subluxation of the hip now that is partially ankylosed, but with a significant shortening and deformity. And the patient, what problem? The patient's problem wasn't the length, it was the deformity. And he wanted resolution of the deformity. If you analyze the deformity and perform a software simulation, uh, you will see that you would need at least three osteotomies uh, to restore this patient's mechanical axis. But, and you cannot, uh, even with trying, cut down the number of osteotomies to get the optimal correction. In using a monolateral system, using the order, so this is order by name and order by design, you can actually use three monolaterals, each one controlling each single osteotomy, and you're able to adjust your correction at each level until your final mechanical axis and your joint orientation angles are within normal limits. So imagine if you were doing the same surgery with three hexapods, they, the, the metal work will simply get in the way of the internal fixation, never mind get in the way of imaging by CR. But with three monolateral rails, it is entirely possible to do multi-level surgery and get the visualization on x-ray and get the adjustment that you need to do uh, to fine tune your result and check your final axis. So the important thing is the fixators do not, when used in series like this, obstruct the x-rays, obstruct the ability to use internal fixation. And this is the fixation on this particular patient, uh, both uh, post-operatively, and you can see that the axis has uh, been restored. The challenge in doing multi-level acute correction is that you will have to know, uh, you will only know that the correction is satisfactory once you have done all the levels. You cannot just do one correction and assume that correction is good enough. You have to do the other levels and then see if the combined effect is that that you require to restore the mechanical axis. And secondly, remember, multi-level surgery is multiple surgery. So you need stamina because each level is a single operation. It involves application of axe-fix, osteotomy, correction, assess the quality of correction, and then internal fixation. So there are several steps for each osteotomy level. Now you may ask yourself, why bother? And the answer is very simple. There is a big difference in these multi-level corrections when using internal fixation and acute correction in the patient's recovery. And you can see this usually by the time one month has passed from the time of surgery. The patients are rehabilitating in a much more uh, uh, enhanced way than compared to uh, an external fixator that runs from the femur all the way across the knee into the tibia. 
But there are also other reasons for adopting this technique. We all know that gradual correction can be painful. It's not always, but can be painful. And if on for a long time, it can challenge any patient's ability to stay with uh, the treatment plan. And finally, we all know that there are some patients who are fixator negative. So the key steps in deformity analysis and simulation do not change in multi-level acute corrections. I've already mentioned in the previous presentation that there are different digital softwares available for you to do your analysis and simulation of correction, uh, including a free one. It's important to uh, choose a fixator that allows you to adjust the correction in case your first attempt at correction is inadequate. So that adjustability is important and the control in the adjustability is important. So a standard fixator like a, a, a Galaxy or a, a, a a striker fixator uh, without that control adjustability takes that control away. And so uh, the adjustments are not as fine. They are much more gross. Uh, you can also achieve the same effect with a circular fixator. The fixator should be able to compress the osteotomy. This is not for primary bone union. The compression at the osteotomy is to increase the contact and to increase the load sharing between the implant and the bone so that the stresses on the implant, particularly with open wedge osteotomies, is reduced and you get healing before the implant fails. And finally, when you've done the multi-level corrections, uh, always check the mechanical axis. And if the mechanical axis is suboptimal, you can perform the adjustments at each of the levels until you get the right correction. And finally, when you have got the right correction, you can substitute uh, internal fixation and then remove the external fixators. So I'm going to show you two examples. Uh, the first is the example that I showed you earlier of the high BMI patient who has miserable malalignment syndrome. You can see that there is internal femoral rotation or torsion uh, as well as external tibial torsion. When you take away in the simulation the effect of rotation, you will see that the tibia itself has no significant deformity. So what this patient needed was a derotation of the femur and a derotation of the tibia. And this can be done acutely. And you can see here on the left image, we have a derotation construct set up uh, on the femur. The rail is applied in anteriorly in the sagittal plane because in the, such, in the anterior application, the femur is straight. If you apply the derotation from the lateral side, the femur is curved and it's much more difficult to get the derotation done with the rail, uh, with, the, with the fixator on the lateral side and with the fixator anteriorly. So here we have the derotation set up uh, anteriorly on the femur and medially uh, on the tibia. Uh, once the derotations are done in the middle picture, the femoral derotation has been done after the osteotomy. The anterior fixator is holding the derotation. I'm now applying a second fixator laterally out of the way of a femoral nail so that I can nail this derotation and remove the anterior fixator before nailing. With the tibia, it's fairly straightforward because we are doing an open plating of the distal tibia. So the derotation is to get the angles correct. And so here you can see we have nailed the femur and we have done a double plating of the tibia simply because this patient has a high BMI and most of the distal tibial constructs are usually uh, trauma products that are made for uh, pilon or distal tibial fractures. And we felt that uh, it wasn't quite strong enough for someone of this size. So we added uh, a second plate uh, at 90 degrees to the first. And so here you have that patient with the miserable malalignment, double level uh, acute derotation, nail in the femur, plate in the tibia. Here is a second example of a multi-level correction, acute correction. And this is a complex multiplanar deformity following a uh, 
septic fascial growth arrests in childhood. So this is the clinical appearance of the limb in the operating room. Uh, in the right hand picture, you can see an overall varus deformity. In the left hand picture, it looks as if that the tibia is posteriorly translated on the femur. So that's why the prominence of the femoral condyles and the patella can be seen. And in reality, if you look at the uh, standing image, even though uh, the patient has a patella that that's is sublux and cannot be positioned accurately, you cannot see the knee joint. And that is because of this uh, not subluxation, but this big deformity in the sagittal plane. And what is this deformity? This deformity is a double deformity. In the femur, in the femoral condyles, there is flexion. In the tibial condyles, there is recovatum or extension. And when you have a double angular deformity, in other words, in two, when you have a double angular deformity in opposite directions, but close to each other, you have the equivalent effect of a bony translation. So this is what I mean. In the femur, we had a flexion deformity of the femoral condyles or procovatum deformity. In the proximal tibia, we had a recovatum deformity or extension deformity. Because these deformities were very close to each other, you had the effect of an overall translation. And this is what you were seeing when you looked at a side view of the knee. So in order to improve the correction, we would have to do two angular corrections, both in the distal femur and the proximal tibia. But don't forget, in the proximal tibia, we also have a varus deformity. So here, these are images that I won't uh, spend too much time, but to show that you can use a monolateral to correct an oblique plane deformity in the proximal tibia by setting up the pins and the rail in such a way that you can correct both the recovatum and the varus. And here is the pin position, the osteotomy, and the acute correction. And as you can see in this image, we perform uh, intraoperative CR measurements of the relevant reference angles. And here we had a, a medial proximal tibial angle of 84 degrees, which I accepted without needing to change because I thought this was close enough to the normal range. Having done this then, we moved on to perform the femoral correction. These are the reference pins, the 10 degree guide that, that uh, Professor Sharma mentioned earlier, so as to correct the femoral deformity together with uh, the pins placed to also correct uh, the procovatum or flexion deformity of the femoral condyles. Final check of the femoral and tibial osteotomies, intraoperative check of the mechanical axis. Mechanical axis looks to be close enough to the center of the knee joint, so I accepted this before substituting uh, with internal fixation. So you will see here in the femur, virtually 100% translation. In the tibia, there is less, but there is a significant anterior open wedge osteotomy, understandably because it was a recovatum deformity. In both these instances, the osteotomy was done percutaneously preserving the soft tissue sleeve as best as one can. This is really important because if you perform and maintain the tissue viability, even big areas of translation will form callus. So as in this case, you can see the post-operative x-ray. This is without bone grafting, uh, healing occurring sometime in the middle phase of recovery. And this is the post-operative lateral view showing consolidation after union uh, of the osteotomy. What about the clinical appearance? Because this is an acute correction. This is something you can see immediately in surgery. You can see that the translation post-operatively, intraoperatively has been corrected 
after closure of the wounds. And here we have that various deformity in the AP that is improved and confirmed by standing x-rays taken after surgery. So to summarize and to conclude, um, I've shown two examples of multi-level correction. One is a rotational correction, and the other one is both a uh, single plane and oblique plane deformity combined together. Uh, there are significant advantages for the patient, but there are additional responsibilities for the surgeon. Your responsibility would be careful analysis and simulation before surgery. Uh, I think uh, the order method uh, allows you to use rails uh, fixation systems much closer to each other without interference of internal fixation or without interference of imaging and checking of angles and axis uh, intraoperatively. Uh, most external fixation systems, the circular or the rail system, allows you to compress osteotomies. The trauma fixator systems like the Galaxy and, and uh, uh, Striker systems, uh, or even Synthes, do not give you that ability to compress so easily, whereas these uh, reconstruction systems uh, do. And the final thing that you need as a surgeon when doing multi-level surgery is you've got to be fit. You have to be able to go the distance because each level is a separate operation in itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naga. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Naga. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Thank you, Professor Absalan. Thank you of all attendees and audience. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Sheikh, for your great help. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Al Ashab. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ahmed Sheikh, can you announce for tomorrow, please? Yes, uh, uh, tomorrow we get a busy day, um, overview over the foot and ankle corrections and then uh, hexapods, ortho SUV and lengthening uh, basics and some uh, uh, monolateral frames with profile um, and joint deformity with problem and hosting. So uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you for all the speakers for this uh, wonderful and heavy day and uh, wish you all good night. Good night. Good night, thank, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Well, you thank, you so much. Night. thank you so much. Thank you so much. At, at the thank final, you. I would like to thank all our eminent speakers from UK and Egypt for joining us tonight. Wishing you all the best and have a very nice night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.